Hey, hey, party people. I'm back. Kind of. My new video schedule is as follows. New video every first Tuesday of the month, 6 p.m. Pacific time. And a new live stream every third Tuesday of the month, 6 p.m. Pacific time. And uh, <laughs> I know today's not the first Tuesday. I messed up. <laughs> but ignore that. Okay. First and third Tuesdays of the month. That's the schedule until I finish my book. Uh, now I guess would be a really great time to click on that little gray notification bell next to the subscribe button so that you can, you know, stay on top of my video schedule. All right. In this video, I want to discuss the latest collections and some of the latest fashion news while I sketch some of some really cool looks from the previous round of fashion shows. And, you know, people ask me all the time how the fashion calendar works, so I'm just going to go over it real fast. Designers show their spring collections in the fall. Wholesale buyers will put in their orders now, right after the shows, and then the design houses run their production all throughout the fall and winter. The design companies, they ship the goods late winter, early spring, and the stores will stock when on their schedule. Like they have their own schedule for when they decide to display items. Designing for fall, winter, you know, the, the next collection, that starts right after the spring, summer shows are over. So yeah, the companies, they are always working on multiple collections at once, you know, producing one collection while designing another collection, et cetera, et cetera. And yes, designers think a year in advance. So let's talk about the runways for spring, summer 2020. Going over the collections, the first thing I noticed was a ton of blue. So much blue. And not just the denim. And I know navy is a very popular staple pretty much always. But there was a ton of really fully saturated blues. Cobalt blue, true blue, baby blue, bright blue, dago blue, Prussian blue, peacock blue, and periwinkle. How many of you have a lot of blue in your wardrobes that's not denim and not navy? I really want to know. You know, I think a lot more people wear, you know, denim and navy and some of the softer, duller blues. But how many of you wear bright, full, saturated blue Unless it's a sports jersey, I think, you know, if you have a home team that you're rooting for, you don't care about the color so much. So other than denim, navy, and bright sports jerseys, how much bright blue do you own? Do you wear, actually? I'd love to hear from you in the comments. Other than the blue, there was so much watered down stuff. Just real blander versions of all the brands, essentially. You know, every every collection looked like that brand's bridge collection, you know. Bridge collections are, you know, the less expensive one quality notch down collections like DKNY is Donna Karen's bridge collection, Mark by Mark Jacobs, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? And, you know, I guess you could call everything more wearable. You know, that's what design houses do when they're afraid of a recession. You know, shoppers shop less in general, and they make safer choices, and designers anticipate that with more toned-down collections, more safer choices for shoppers to get. And, you know, fashion has always been a bellwether for global economics. So when you see runway shows en masse show more toned-down, more wearable, safer collections, not just the handful that you watch every season, but across the board then that should be a hint, like on a bigger scale. I also saw a ton of 80s reboots, tacky florals better suited for cheap motel curtains, shoulder emphasis, big sleeves, Lego mutton sleeves. Lego mutton sleeves are when it's like really big and poofy at the shoulder and then they taper down to really narrow and fitted at the wrist. And they're called Lego mutton sleeves because mutton is another word for lamb. So it's like a lamb's leg looking sleeve, I guess, is the name. And uh, there's always some plaid. 
plaid is a fashion staple, but this season the majority of the plaids were in wild colors. So that's very 80s going into the 90s. Wildly color plaid always reminds me of that movie Clueless. <laughs> There are some 80s style markers that I do think look modern, namely the longer hems. So there was everything in between below the knee and T-length, which is just above the ankle, uh, and relaxed waists. I did see some mini skirts. I did, but there were a lot longer hemlines in general. Uh, speaking of minis, the whole power dressing look is back in some design houses, but... <sighs> Okay, this is my old lady showing, but I am an old lady who thinks nobody did power dressing better than OG Terry Mugler. And, you know, even Parenza Schuler tried a weak version of power dressing, and I was surprised because that is not really their brand normally. But personal opinion, power dressing is one of those things that you either do or you don't. If you do like a watered down version, it just doesn't look good at all. And uh, I think that's why I never liked Armani very much. You know, Armani always looks like watered down power dressing to me. And I acknowledge Armani quality and Armani's contribution to our fashion history landscape. But aesthetically, I've never been a fan. And for some reason, everyone and their mother and their sister and their auntie did a deep V with a turtleneck. I don't know. It was everywhere. Dries Van Noten did a collab collection with Christian Lacroix, and I loved it. You can really see both designers' aesthetics in this collection. I think the merge really worked, and I would love to see them do a collaboration again. I always thought that Oscar de la Renta was a brand for old ladies who did not look like old ladies, but this collection smelled like old lady. I mean, not all of it, you know, but... There were way too many 80s bridesmaid dresses that were cut from a Guns N' Roses video. Erdem mm. was gorgeous. Some of the prints and print combinations were like Dries Van Loten level gorgeous. Tom Brown and Aria had their own versions, separate versions of crinolines and hoop skirts and pannier cages outside of clothes done in ridiculous materials. And I loved all of them, they were so unnecessary, and yet they were so necessary in this very boring season. Loved it. House of Holland's homage to Yayoi Kusama was weekend boring. It had all of the dots and none of the intensity. Yayoi Kusama is not just about dots, okay? It's the way the dots are done so that they're vibrating off the canvas and they make you feel itchy on the inside. And that's on purpose, you know? But this just, I mean, I don't know if they were trying to do an homage to Kusama, but there were just so many dots that kind of were in that direction, but just not hitting it. Mary Katransu... It was grandiose. It didn't look like her stuff normally, but it was great. Chanel looked boring. Balenciaga looked boring. I don't really understand what those gigantic Hershey's kisses were doing on the runway, but whatever. Just more 80s crap. And Vivetta was just as saccharine. You know, I love their last collection, but it was more wearable this time. But when you have a brand like Vivetta that's so saccharine and over the top, slightly more wearable, is still okay. If you want to study how trends at the couture level become beautifully translated to more wearable pieces at the ready-to-wear level, and they're just still stunning, go look at Valentino. Go look at the Spring Summer 2020 collection. Go look at the last couture collection and study them side by side and see how... You know, there's that beautiful transition from couture to ready to wear without it looking too bland, too derivative. It still is really beautiful. Junya Watanabe did dozens of deconstructed trench coats, and that is so up my alley. Loved all the trenches. Speaking of trenches, Alexander McQueen did a few deconstructed, reconstructed trenches, and I love those too. This McQueen collection actually looked more McQueen than it's looked in a long time, I think. 
You know, it's missing some of the major theatrics and the most avant-garde pieces. But for example, this structured jacket with extravagant ruffles is classic McQueen. Both Gucci and Monique Lulier had these really sexy 70s vibes without looking overly retro. You know, but what was that weird straight jacket lineup at Gucci? Like, what even was that? Yeah, moving on. Jean Patou, the house of Jean Patou has been revived, and this collection is pretty cute. It doesn't look like old Patou, but follows the original Monsieur Patou's design views that clothes should be comfortable, that women should be able to move while looking beautiful. Um, Monsieur Patou liked to incorporate sporty details. And I discuss them a bit in my first fashion history video, which I'll link in the description box below. But uh, he got started about the same time as Chanel, and he championed comfort in women's fashion as much as she did. We just don't remember him other than the perfume Joy. Okay? Uh, Patu shut down in the 80s, I believe. Previous Patu House creative directors include Jean-Paul Gaultier, Karl Lagerfeld, Marc Bohan, and Christian Lacroix. And now Patu has been revived, and I am looking forward to seeing more from this revival. Now I want to discuss some of the major fashion news stories of September and October. First up, the Forever 21 bankruptcy. So as of this taping, uh, it's not a secret or a rumor that Forever 21 is going bankrupt. They have filed for bankruptcy and they are pulling stores. Uh, I believe 350 stores in 40 countries are being closed. Whew. That is not a small amount. Here's what I think went wrong. Forever 21 became like Facebook. You know, Forever 21, it used to be young and hip and cute and sassy and young girls and women were, they were all over it. And Forever 21 grew and grew. Same as Facebook. When Facebook first got started, it was for young college kids. And I think that you actually needed a college.edu address, email address, in order to sign up. So Forever 21 is everywhere, every mall, every city, every country. I think they're like the biggest mall space renters in all of the U.S. or something like that. And when something is too accessible, it becomes less cool. And when the moms discovered Forever 21 en masse, the kids are like, no, I don't want to wear the same stuff my mom is wearing, especially the high school kids. So they left to shop at places the moms hadn't discovered yet, like Fashion Nova, ASOS. And, you know, the kids left Facebook when their parents and their grandparents took over because it wasn't cool anymore. They went to Instagram and then Snapchat, and now they're over at TikTok. Why? Because old people like me don't know how to use TikTok. Facebook had to pivot. Instead of being the cool social media site for young kids, Facebook transformed itself into an online life necessity. You know how you can log into lots of other websites using your Facebook profile for verification? And you know how uh, that whole, uh, there was a whole point of time where Facebook wanted everyone to use their real legal names and were shutting down profiles of those that appeared to be not their birth certificate names. And it really caused an uproar with trans people, drag queens, and other performers. So anyway, Forever 21 has to pivot into something new in order to survive like Facebook did. Next news item, actually it's not a news item, it's just something I learned. And this one is about a particular business model. This is about Costco. It relates, I promise. I recently learned that Costco has the smallest markups on groceries out of all the big U.S. chains. It's about at 11%, which is lower than the grocery markups at even Walmart and Target. What they make their money on is their annual membership fees. Something like more than $4 billion a year on annual membership fees. It's been a couple years since I've had a Costco card, but if I recall, it was about $60 a year for the annual membership. So if you, those of you who don't know, Costco, uh, they, you have to have a Costco card in order to enter the store and check out, and you pay an annual fee, 
And they also have like an executive level where you get more benefits and you pay more every year. So the value for the customers is that they save more on groceries than they pay for the annual fee. So people accept the exchange. Like I'm going to save more than $60 on groceries for how much I shop at Costco. So it's worth it to me to pay the $60 annual fee. Because they want to make sure that they use up their annual fee, they keep shopping at Costco. You know, and of course, you know, Costco offers very competitive pricing, so it's no skin off your nose to want to go to Costco. Costco is, you know, people say that it's one of those, you know, few huge companies that actually pay their workers well and they treat them better than your average massive chain. Costco offers competitive pricing, which they can afford to do so because Costco makes more money on the volume of goods sold, even with the smaller markup, and makes money on those annual fees. This is a business model to think about and to think about how it can convert into different industries. Hint, hint. Relatedly, another business model to think about is Guapay's business model. I talked about it in her fashion biography video, which I'll link in the, uh, the description box below as well. The way her business is run is customers pay an annual membership fee to the Guapé Shoppers Club. And every time somebody buys something, they don't pay for the dress. The amount of the dress gets, you know, taken off of their membership fee. As you hear about bankruptcies and different, you know, think about different business models moving forward, how you can, you know, use the changing landscape of retail to fit your needs. Next, I want to talk about Rent the Runway. Long story short, Rent the Runway had a supply chain catastrophe and they couldn't fill orders and they had to halt operations and they had to refund everybody. And it caused a huge uproar. You know, think about it. Rent the Runway customers, the bulk of their customers, they don't just idly shop for stuff, just cruising around. They go there because they have an event they need to dress for, and that event has a specific date. And if they can't get their dress rental on time, they're screwed. And so Rent the Runway actually gave their customers who had already placed an order and added $200 onto their refund. It's a mess, and I don't want it to be a mess. You know, if fast fashion companies like Forever 21 all die and go away... Great, wonderful. But I love the idea of rental services for clothes. Quality fancy clothes being rented and reworn. Yeah, you know, instead of disposable crap worn twice and tossed into a landfill, I'm into it. I think that with the rise of rental services, people will be more inclined to shop quality. They will you know, renting things and returning things, you still get the excitement of wearing a new thing without buying a bunch of crap you wear once and throw away. So the general idea of rental services for clothing is appealing to me. And, you know, people joke that Rent the Runway is basically a massive dry cleaning business. <laughs> but, you know, we can find better and better ways to dry clean, you know, but we're stuck with this polyester crap in landfills and I'm, I'm so over it. I would love to see rental businesses in general thrive. But a few points I want to mention. One, design isn't everything. A company has a bad season and something happens and the first people to get fired are from the design team. You know, companies focus so much on design, they fail to learn about and implement strong production coordinators and sales and distribution teams. This whole colossal debacle is a supply chain mess. That's not my opinion. That's what's all over the news. You know, so when you start your own line, you need to make sure that there are no weak links in your business. Two, as fashion and tech merge more and more into its own category, like Rent the Runway, I find that the expertise behind these companies are tech heavy and fashion light. Most of the VCs who invest in these companies come from tech, and too many VCs think the fashion part is easy. But tangible objects like fashion, things that you have to source materials for and make and sell and ship, not like 
online services and websites, you know, fashion, tangible objects, they don't scale the same as tech. And these companies need more fashion expertise to guide them. Listen, y'all, beware of too fast growth. Rent the Runway was at a billion dollar valuation before they tripped over their own shoelaces. Third Love is another quickly growing company that is rife with controversy. The Real Real is another huge hotbed of controversy, a company that grew too big and now is showing inaccuracies in their authentications and story upon story of how their employees are being mistreated terribly. People see meteoric rise and they get jealous. Don't. Grow as fast as you can handle. The size of a company and their valuation and how much money they make aren't the only hallmarks of a great company. How about a company that treats its employees well, pays them reasonable salaries, produces ethically, and pays it forward with charitable donations? What are your company's core values beyond making as much money as possible? All right, rant's over. Please give this video a thumbs up if you learned something new today or you're just glad I'm back. <laughs> share, subscribe, do hit that little gray notification bell. Please take note of the new video schedule and I will see you in the next video. It's good to be back.